so what I want to do today is um, I'll talk for I think around 15 or 20 minutes and I want to sort of introduce the idea of conceptual writing to everybody and talk a little bit about its, its links to conceptual art and to, to LeWitt in particular. Um, and standing here, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor of literature, so I always feel envy of my, I've always felt envy of my art historical colleagues um, who get to, you know, show paintings, right, and beautiful art and, in a classroom, and students will be there and they'll just gaze upon these, these works and how easy their job is, right? <laughs> As compared to my incredibly difficult laborious job of like bringing penguin classics to life. But then standing here, I realized actually it's way harder to be an art, art history professor because nobody wants to hear from you. They just want to look <laughs> at, at, at like these cool things around you. So I'll do what I can, and you can you know like have your minutes of silence gazing at the at the wit around us. Um, so this particular wit is called "All Two Part Combinations of Arcs from Corners and Sides and Straight, Not Straight, Broken Lines." Um, I myself. Um, like LeWitt Strassman, need a set of instructions. So I'm going to speak casually, but I'm going to have my instructions here with me while I, while I do that. So I think the, the question I want to ask today is just, what could writing learn from LeWitt? Right? What could literature learn from LeWitt? And what would literature that has learned from LeWitt and other conceptual writers uh, look like? And if they had learned from LeWitt and other conceptual writers, would we want to read it? Um, and if we don't want to read it, are there other things we could do with it? Could we listen to it? Could we look at it? Um, maybe we could just think about it. So the remarkable thing for me anyway, someone who, who works mostly, works mostly on the 19th century novel and a little bit on, on contemporary, um, on creative writing, or conceptual writing, contemporary poetry, is how the practices that are pretty much institutionally, you know, institutionalized at this point in the visual arts, uh, Things like, say, setting up instructions to be executed by unskilled draftspeople like LeWitt's law, law drawings, all of which are executed, uh, in this case, by someone other than Saul LeWitt. Or, say, with Warhol's silk screens of other people's photographs, or even of like newspaper photography. Or even Picasso, right, early 20th century collage work. Those things that are like routine in art now are still really conspicuous and bug people in literature and in writing. This collage work and writing can um, really get under people's skin, and people will regard this as outrageous in some way that you would write, say, maybe a novel comprised entirely of quotations from someone else's novel. Or in the case of one of the works we'll look at today, a 600-page book comprised entirely of words that, and phrases that end in the, in the schwa sound, in the R sound, right? arranged according to uh, alphabetically and according to syllable count. Or a work um, called Dicte that is the 800-word 800 800 poem of all the words in Moby Dick that start with un. <laughs> so we won't read all of those. So I guess I just begin by noting that Lewitt's hand is not actually involved right, in producing this work that's around us. And if you want to find the Lewitt, it's in the set of instructions outside this room. This room is unusual in the sense that you would actually have to go outside of it. And those instructions are painted on the wall there. But one of the things that's really important to notice that, is that LeWitt is bringing language into painting, right? he's bringing language into the production of art. And the context for conceptual writing is 60s and 70s conceptual art. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that work as a kind of context and a point of departure for conceptual writing. So when conceptual art comes out, starts to emerge in the 60s and 70s, I feel conspicuous talking about this. There are art historians in this room that know so much more about this than I do, but I'll just continue. Go along, and then you can correct me later. Um, a lot of those artists are writing in earlier moments in the 20th century, and in particular thinking about um, Marcel Duchamp's works, that is, things like the urinal, right, or the stool, or the snow shovel suspended, that is, ready mades Things that actually changed a lot about the context of art, that is, no longer a question of, is this something that was made by an individual and artistic status that didn't depend on intrinsic qualities, but simply contextualizing it within a museum. So this changed a lot of the fundamental assumptions about art, I think, as Duchamp did and then a couple later generations in the 60s and 70s. We tend to think of paintings and poems and novels uh, and other kinds of artworks as having authors. But Duchamp's ready-mades, these industrial-produced right, objects, are simply presented and recontextualized. 
So this license is a, a different kind of artistic practice, something where you can, you can work with things that can be appropriated uh, and simply placed in a new context and they can be framed. So there are two big moves that I think are important for the conceptual art and then in turn for conceptual writing. And the first is that conceptual art starts to privilege the intellectual over the visual, right? ideas over representations, and start to emphasize the artistic play. So Duchamp says early in the 20th century, everything was becoming conceptual. It depended on things other than the retina. So a shift away from the object itself and a shift away from the experience and, uh, and uh, from a, uh, the experience of aesthetic appreciation or emotional intensity into something like the act of perception itself. And Lewitt has a version, a version of this. If, if you look at, we can look at these later, um, these paragraphs on conceptual art. Lewitt says, what the work of art looks like isn't too important. That is, the idea or the concept of the mo is the most important aspect of the work. And the idea itself, even if not made visual, is as much a work of art as any finished product. So it's valuing process over product. It's de-aestheticized, de-skilled, unexpressive. And then there's also a kind of like serial logic to it, like permutational logic. If you go through the three floors of this, of this exhibit, you know, you'll see there are a lot of variations in the kinds of, of, of the work that the wind is producing. These are in some ways almost stripped down, uh, and then you get all these bright colors one floor up from us. But like, they're basically all permutations of the same set of formal concerns, right? around the same size, all working out through the same set, through different sets of instructions. Uh, the second big moment, I think, is that in conceptual art, it allows artists to begin to think about language in general. That is to bring language into their art, to draw upon language from any place, like newspapers, advertisements, or right, books, and bring those into art. So a couple of big moments in this. Um, Robert Rauschenberg, uh, in 1961, he was asked to contribute a portrait for a portrait show for, this, for the Iris Clark Gallery, and all the artists were meant to do a portrait of Iris Clark for the show. Rauschenberg sent a telegram that says, that reads, this is a portrait of Iris Clark if I say so. That it substitutes in language for representation. Uh, a second moment is Robert Smithson's piece, uh, 1966, called A Heap of Language. And this was in a, a gallery show in New York uh, in 1967 called Language to be Looked at and Are Things to be Read. And it was simply, it was handwritten, a pie, it was literally a pile of language. So words like speech, tongue, phraseology, dialect, brogue, and about like this big and, and piled up in a, in a pyramid. So when conceptual art starts to be, begin to present text as art, it actually began to ask what the status of painting is, what its subject is, language. So for example, John Baldessari uh, um, does a, a conceptual artist who produces a series of text paintings. And at that time, he would have someone else prime the canvas, who would often have a commercial painter uh, paint the actual words. Uh, and those words were often lifted from elsewhere. They're unattributed quotations. So for example, this is a 1966 work, um, and this is the work. The title is the work, and these are the words. Everything has been purged from this painting but art. No ideas have entered this work. This is like a great thing, right? It's like a Harpo Marx painting or something, right? That is, you can't speak, but can actually express this. Or it's like an own goal in soccer, where you, at the moment when you say there are no ideas, right? There are ideas. Okay. So, a few things that conceptual art and conceptual writing share. That is, one of the things is these writers and artists tend to set up a set of rules and then just produce works out of those rules, right? That is, just follow them. And then the artist's job is to inventory those results. A second thing is to, is to in some ways, get us away from the notion of the artist as sort of original or as genius. Um, Wordsworth in the, in the, in the um, later part of the 18th century, early part of the 19th century, is writing poems, actually, actually begging Congress to extend copyright. Because he says, my work is so crazy original that it's gonna take a couple generations for people to really appreciate it. And I want my grandchildren to get the dough from my copyright. Right? So Wordsworth is like the kind of epicenter of this in cartoon version, epicenter of this idea of the artist as, as original and artist as genius. And that's what these artists I think are really trying to move away from. And then a second thing, a third thing is a, a kind of mimicking of commercial or amateur processes in the art. That is the way kind of other people are to actually execute these paintings. And those people are not trained. As LeWitt says, all the, all the planning is undertaken beforehand and the execution is a perfunctory affair. So the first, the first writer that I want to talk about is not a writer at all. It's Andy Warhol. 
he's not actually a conceptual artist, he's a pop artist. But I think that his novel, um, which is a novel, uh, produced in 1968, is actually the, the link that, that is, is really crucial for these later, more contemporary conceptual writers. So what this novel was meant to be, many of you probably know that Andy Warhol wrote a novel. He didn't. He recorded a novel, and then he hired other people to trans transcribe those tapes. But it wasn't really a novel. It was actually just him in the factory with all of his pals and the other superstars. Right? So it's simply recordings of their conversations. And he then hired typists to transcribe those tapes, but gave them no instructions about how to do it. So there's radical kind of changes in the, in the layout of the book, right? Some people are like into the double column thing, and then other people just start like going like this, or they get tired of the double columns and they have to change it around. So I will, I will read to you uh, uh, from an earlier moment here, from the opening. Okay. This is, I should say, a 458 page book. Rattle, gurgle, clink, tinkle, click, pause, ring, ring, dial, dial. Undine. You said dial that, that if, if you pick, pick up the mayor's voice on the other end, dial, pause, dial, dial, dial. The mayor's sister would know us, be busy, 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 Drella. We should start from the park, right? Okay, mm. coin drops, money jingles as coins return, car noises in the background. You're a clunk. Are there any way stations on the way that we have to honk, 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 like uh, I, what, noise? If we go through, through the park, is there any place we can keep calling your uh? I mean, right through the uh phone calls, is there any place where we can keep calling him if we uh? Answering service. Are you cars honking, bossing? Are there different places? Are there different places where we can call your answer? Oh, want some cake? Nah. A little juice, anything? I know where we can get some, hurriedly. Oh, yes, let's get some. Fantastic, baby. Yeah, good. Oh, you can't pretend that you're not here. Okay, all right. You're, uh, I mean, all uh, right. You're, uh, you're, you're here, okay? You're here, okay? You definitely are here. Uh, noise. Okay, that's like half of the first page of, of this book. You're, you're longing for that cake in moment of silence right now. I, I would expect. So there's a question here, which is like, how do you deal with the confusion of this novel? That is, in one sense, like, how the hell are you supposed to read this? So one, one thing you could do is just start skimming, looking for plot, or looking for the dirty parts, of which there are many, many, many. One of the typists' mothers, uh, one of the typists was Mo Tucker, future drummer for Velvet Underground. Uh, uh, Mo Tucker's mom threw out one of the tapes because they're too filthy. So it's actually missing right, some stuff. And when Warhol went through this stuff, he edited it, quote, edited it, but left all the errors in. Actually, like, likes the errors. So you could do a couple things. You could skim. You can kind of skip over the local disruptions, right? Try to find something like plot. But when there actually isn't any plot, you have to ask yourself, okay, so what do you pay attention to? And then you start to pay attention to things like typography and layout, right? That is the material aspects of the language on the page. And this is something we're really not used to doing in if I asked any of my students what the font was for Bleak, the Bleak House, uh, the copy of Bleak House that I asked them to read, they would all be blank. Right? They're like, what? Those are just words. Like, I'm not paying attention to the words. I'm just getting, you know, the ideas behind the words. Uh, for Warhol, I think that this novel forces us to oscillate between reading it super, superficially and then reading it so completely that we might start to feel a little crazy. As we could start, you could plausibly read this book letter by letter. There are moments where, like, Things are capitalized, and you don't know if they're supposed to be capitalized because of like emphasis, right? That it's trying to like reproduce the speech somehow, or if just like the caps lock key got stuck on a typewriter. And I point this out to my students: you couldn't do this novel now because Word would correct all of the mistakes, right? As you go along, and your caps lock key—it's hard to get it stuck in that way. Um, I think one, two things to notice about this book: one, it's de-skilled. Right? That is, Warhol, like the wit, is asking other people to actually write the novel, actually produce it, in the same way that, that assistants produce the wit. And then the second thing, as Warhol says about, um, about his art, he says, I wanted to do bad movies and bad art. And one of the noted aspects of Warhol's silk screens are like, they're not that good, right? The paint bleeds out from the edges of where the silk screen is supposed to be. But that's how you actually know it's a Warhol, that bleeding. The second aspect of it that I think is worth thinking about, um, is something is to think about like um, mediation, like running ideas through other people, right, and seeing what happens. The wit says in his paragraphs on on wall drawings, uh, he says errors are part of the work of art. If people make mistakes, that's part of the work. And Warhol really, really likes mistakes. So when he talks about um, at one point, he talks about uh, hiring an assistant. And he says, you know what I really want an assistant? I want someone who misunderstands me a little bit. 
He wants someone who will like mediate his ideas and, and tweak them unintentionally. So they'll actually come out distorted, like a, like a game of telephone. And I think that, that that's actually the subject of this book, that is media systems. That whole first page is about trying to get a phone call accomplished with a payphone into the old days, right, with a payphone. It's obsessive about running stuff through different media systems. So there are a few differences, though, I think, between conceptual art and conceptual writing. One of them is that you know, conceptual art is oriented toward like, undermining the idea of a singular work of art that is just one painting, uh, as in the case of Warhol. Right? That is, what would it mean to have like, an original silkscreen if there are 50 of them? But that's something that writing has just taken as a given. There are always multiple copies of a poem or of a novel, right? multiple editions of something. So it's all, writing is always dependent on copies. And then secondly, um, conceptual art puts words up on canvases or in instructions or in instructions, and actually seems to oppose the idea to an art object. That is opposing, right, concept versus object. But this has the effect of actually turning language itself, that is a written, written or printed word, into something not just to be read, but to be looked at, okay, to be treated as art. But if conceptual art asks if language can be art, writing has always treated language as art. And a second difference, I think, is that writing and conceptual, a uh, language and conceptual writing is super material. That is, it's like stuff to be cut and pasted and clicked on and poured into different containers and reframed. That is, while conceptual art is often abstract, like that there's no painting to look at, right? there's no actual canvas, conceptual writing is super concrete often. And this is, you know, it's drawing attention to the basic fact of language. Language always has had a double life. On the one hand, there's just the meaning of a word, right? That is, what does it, what is its sense? What does a word mean? What does a sentence mean? And then the second is the, what would be just like the material dimension. What does it sound like? What does it look like? And that's the aspect of language I think we often tend to forget. We tend to treat language as if it were like a translucent container or something that you just pour ideas into. And so conceptual writing aspect of the language might be treated not as art, but as material. Like material, like like clay, right? That you could like push around. And there's this there's a story. Um, Edgar Degas, this this painter, is talking to his buddy um, Mallarmé, who's a poet. And Degas says, "You know, I have all these ideas for poems, and I just can't get them down." And 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 Mallarmé, tweaking him a little bit, says, uh, "Poems are made with words, not with ideas." Conceptual writers want to take that that notion really, really to heart. So conceptual writing tends to set up a kind of algorithm that, to organize the writing uh, and then produce something. But unlike LeWitt, I think for conceptual writing, what the product is really matters. That is, it's not the case that it doesn't matter what it looks like. For conceptual writers, it really matters what that kind of finished product is. So another writer, um, uh, the, the second of the three that I want to just mention today, a guy named Kenneth Goldsmith, who's pretty much a latter-day Warhol, but like in a super minor key, as you might expect for a writer rather than a visual artist. He was actually trained at RISD, so he trained as a sculptor, and did not have a very successful career as a sculptor, so made a career move and switched into writing, where his stock has since risen uh, exponentially. He teaches at the University of Pennsylvania right now. And a few of his works um, include uh, a book called Day, in which he transcribed the entirety of a day of an edition of the New York Times, every single word going across. Right? So if there was like a picture with a car and a license plate, he wrote out the letters of the license plate as he, as he went along. Uh, and then he has a trilogy called Traffic, Weather, and Sports. I think you could probably guess what that is if you're a fan of like radio at all. So it's a transcription of every traffic report on 1010 wins for a year, and every weather report, and then every sports update. Uh, they actually are astonishingly compelling works. So it turns out, with traffic, a disaster is always about to happen, and then it kind of fades away. Same with weather. It's like doom is always hanging over New York City in the form of weather, and then it dissipates somehow. Um, Goldsmith is really interested, I think, in the direct presentation of language itself. That is, language not is something to be expressive, not like words working in spontaneous overflow or powerful feeling, but just like language in front of you. Something to be organized and cataloged and accumulated. So he has a, a work from, uh, called uh, Snappily titled Number 111, colon 2793 through 102096. 600, this is it, a 600 page catalog of found language words and phrases. 
that he collected over a three-year period of phrases, words and phrases that end in the, in the schwa, the R sound. Arranged into chapters, according to syllable count and alphabetized, begins with single syllable words that ends with a 7,228-syllable 7, short story, J.H. Lawrence's The Rocky Horse Winner. Winner, yeah. He says that he didn't read it. He just counted the syllables and then transcribed it. So here's what's crazy about this book. It reads as like entirely impersonal, right? These are just like languages ready made Stuff he took off of billboards and the internet and magazines and TV. So they're not expressive of his, of his songs. They are, they're not like love letters. There, there's no emo, none of his own emotion. And at the same time, they're utterly confessional because it's everything he's been reading and watching and coming into contact with over three years. So here's just a little, a little sample. This is chapter three from chapter three. Air Fowler, Air Bladder, Air Fair War, Actora, El Fanta, El Rover, El Decor, Albert Spear, El Sina, El Coa, El Donna, El Connor, El Agar, Alfalfa, Algebra, El Gunzer, El Cow, All Dogs Are, All Men Are, El Nagar, Aloha, Alzheimer, Ambrosia, Amoeba, An or Ah, Ananda, Anaphor, Ancestor, An Ah, Ah, and Beaters, and Better, and Bigger, and Bleepers, and Flippers. And so that's chapter three. And by the time, you, you know, you get these like rhythmic catalogs. Right? Like, who knew that, um, for example, that um, uh, Ambrosia and Amoeba, right? Those actually sound really good together, right? Those are beautiful, like, nice, nice little, little rhymes in there. And as it goes along, you start to get these more grammatically intact sentences, but it never actually coalesces into a story. So this is from chapter 30. He caused the workmen to begin to speak in different languages so that they could not communicate with each other. I found a new desire and enjoyment in rambling about whatever seems appropriate at the time, so here we are. I had the recorder on, so it was just crazy to listen to it over and over again on the recorder. I hate it that my wife is drop dead beautiful because I can't even turn my damn head without some fool hitting on her. I hate it when men have hair on their backs, especially when it's really dark and it comes out of the back of their trousers. I only have problems with Kathy Joe when she's going on about the sucky counting crows of their doofus lead singer. Right. So I won't like do a close reading here, but just notice like an eye shows up here, but it's not him. It's like totally impersonal. And at the same time, it's like weirdly confessional. It's so intimate. It's like someone went on your computer and opened up your web browser history and they found out what you've been reading on the internet. But include everything, right? Your books. It's like he set up, um, what's the NSA program? Prism. It's like he set up his own personal NSA surveillance program, but like the least useful one of all time because it's focused on one dude. And it's only emails and phone calls that end in the er sound. But it does kind of make you want to get him together with Edward Snowden. <laughs> so what this ends up with, is, it's a totally useless reference book, but it's utterly precise. You could find out where any phrase is right, within it. Totally indexable. Um, at the same time, for all the control he exercises over it, right, he couldn't predict what the results were going to be. So a second book of his, uh, Soliloquy, this is pretty much the inversion of that book. This is where he mic'd himself for a week and then transcribed it only his words. So excise everybody else's conversation, everything else. There are no pauses in here, there's no takes of breath, but most of all, this is really frightening, it's all exteriority, right? There's no thought, there's not a single thought in this book, it's all externalized speech. It's like if you like took a Henry James novel, you know like late Henry James where it's all vocalized like through a particular character and you just get tons of thinking. <coughs> if you took that and like pulled it like a glove and pulled it inside out, you would have a character where it's just all talk. <laughs> okay, so I'll just, I'll just give you a quick, a, quick uh, a quick taste of this. Good morning, how you doing? Yeah, wait a second, I have my ticket. Okay, there you go, thanks, see you, see you soon. Oh, 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 I thought you said have a good weekend. Oh, okay, have a good week, see you later. How you doing? All right, all right, two please. You don't have to save that for four, is it okay? Do you have any newspapers lying around? I'll just have a coffee to start. Thanks, okay, babe, okay. How you doing? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, it goes on, right? This is a 600 page book. Um, but he's already moved from like his, his apartment to the subway, right? And then to a coffee shop. Um, I think that this should remind us a little bit of the word heap. That is of Robert Smithson's word heap. Uh, Goldsmith's line about this book, he said, the moniker for this work was, if every word spoken in New York City daily were somehow to materialize as a snowflake, each day there would be a blizzard. He's really interested, Goldsmith's really interested in the accumulation of language. That is, how much would language weigh? This began as a performance piece in which he read each page and then dropped it from a balcony as it floated to the, and then it floated to the ground. 
So I think in some sense you can think about, I mean, look, I, I threatened you with these books, right? They're massive, they're really, right? there's no way I could read them aloud. Um, I do assign these to my students. Um, but if you think about the early 20th century writing as being kind of beset by a problem like difficult language, and then think about Joyce's Finnegan's Way, or even think about your know, shorter stuff like Pounds Punks, this work, I think, produces a problem of like quantity instead, right? Right. rather than difficulty. It's a problem of like the massiveness of, of, of language coming over us. And if you think about um, how many words we encounter every day, we encounter those right, since email, we encounter way more words in print every day than our than previous generations did. And so to think a little bit about how we navigate through that, that amount of data. Goldsmith says that you don't need to read his works. You just need to understand the idea. He says that he wants a thinkership rather than a readership. I don't think that's quite right. That is, I think you actually have to kind of take some account of what he, of what he produces. Um, I'll just mention one last, one last person. Uh, this is a Christian book, uh, Eunoia. Uh, and this is a novel, or a poem rather, um, that has five chapters, A, E, I, O, and U, and each chapter only contains words that use that chapter's particular vowel. And there are a bunch of other constraints, like you have to have like a, a nautical voyage in each one, there has to be like a prurient debauch, there has to be a banquet in each one. Uh, and Bach, Christian Book did this by combing through the Webster's Third International Dictionary by hand, three times over seven years, collating words. Right? That is only words with single vowels in them. So just, I'll give you a, a quick taste of something and then I'll, I'll, I, will, I will finish up here. This is chapter A. Awkward grammar of Paul as a craftsman, a dada bard as daft as Zara, damn stagnant art and scrawls and alphabet, a slapdash arc and backwards eye that mars all stanzas and jams all ballads. What a scandal. A madcap vandal across a small black arm, a handstand that can stamp a wax pad, and at last plant a mark with sparks and ars magna, an abstract art that charts a phrasal anagram. A pagan skull chants a dark saga, a Mahabharata, as a papal cabal, black balls, all annals and tracts, all dramas and psalms, Kant and Kafka, Marx and Marat, a law as harsh as a fatwa, bans all paragraphs that lack an A as a standard hallmark. I think that this, this work is the work I think that is most like the one that we're standing in. Right? It's utterly exhaustive. As, I mean, the title of this, of this particular work is every, right, every line, right, every, all two-part combinations of arcs form corners and sides, and straight and not straight broken lines. And that sense of exhaustiveness, that is the, the permutation cataloging every single thing within it, I think is what, is what Unoya gives us. Um, a few other things, but I think I will, I, will, I will invite David to take my place here, uh, and then we'll, we'll have a conversation afterwards. So thank you all for listening to this. And, um, yeah. I'm not a scholar, so even though I teach at Yale, I always tell my students that they can never use anything I say in front of anyone who knows anything, <laughs> because I, everything that I do comes from the perspective of um, people who make it. So I'm very concerned with the business of making music, and that's sort of the only thing I know anything about. It's the history of how people make things in music. For example, since we started with John Cage, Four minutes and 33 seconds. I wasn't going to talk about this, but since it came up, I thought I would tell you a little bit about what that piece means, because in a way, Cage is the spiritual grandfather of all of this thinking, of all of this idea of saying, well, there's a problem between the making of something and the receiving of something, and let's see if we can um, look at that as a wound that we can stick our finger in as far as it will go. Where will that get us? So the interesting thing about Cage Cage was a young composer once. You know, we think of Cage as being a great genius whose work and thinking allowed him to take over the entire world. But actually, at the beginning of his life, he was a young composer whose teacher, one of the strictest, most European, most thoughtful composers, Arnold Schoenberg, didn't like him. Um, Arnold Schoenberg famously said to Cage in a lecture, um, in a composition lesson, he held up a pencil and he pointed at the eraser and he said, this end is the more important end. 
um, which Cage thought about his entire life. Um, but Cage was a young composer, and when he started trying to get his music played, nobody would play his music. So all of the things that he did came out of his desire to become a successful composer. He couldn't find people to work with in the music world, and so he decided, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to, um, I can't find lots of instrumentalists to play with me, so I'm going to put pieces of metal and junk in the strings of a piano so I can have a percussion orchestra all my own. Um, he started thinking, I'm interested in all this interesting music and nobody wants to know anything about it, so he decided he would become a lecturer about all the things that we're interested in about in contemporary music. So he started going out lecturing to anybody who would hire him. And in fact, you can actually go on YouTube and see um, him on television, on What's My Line, um, talking about contemporary music. And he makes this incredible realization at one point. You know, I'm working so hard in all of these pieces to have them have some proportion. I want to have this measure be the same length as that measure, and this phrase be the same length as that phrase. Because, you know, as musicians, we care about how these things are organized. We like to organize things. And he started thinking, but I'm, I'm not playing any of my music for anybody. I'm just giving talks about music. What if all of my talks had the same form as all of my as, as all of my pieces? Can I just take the same phrase lengths for my music, and instead of filling those with notes, can I fill them with words? So he has an incredible book called Silence, and he actually tells you in some pieces, I have this speech, and it's exactly the same phrase lengths as this piece of music. So in his mind, these things are being confused. What's interesting about Cage, and where we get to four minutes and 33 seconds, when Cage was a young composer, the definition that all composers talked about, about how we make music, what's the definition of music? People would use the definition that was invented by the composer Barres, and they would say music is organized sound. And I think we would all agree, right? What do you do as a, as a composer of any kind of music, right? You have some kind of sound, and you make some kind of decision about how long it lasts, or the order of things, or what you do with it, or where it goes, right? Or you have this thing and this thing, and you put them in that order, right? So you're doing two things. You're organizing things, and you're making things that need to be organized, right? You have a melody, and you have a form. You have something to listen to, and you have a decision about how you organize what you listen to. Cage's whole life, was thinking about, what if we imagined those things as a spectrum? Can you imagine that there's something that's so far on the sound side that there's no form left? Can you imagine something that's so far on the form side that there's no sound left? If we agree that every place on the middle of this is music, like if something is just beautiful, melodic, and just noodling around, it's really great, we hear it, um, we would all think, that's music, that sounds really nice, that's music, that's sound, right? Even if it's not organized so well, even if it lasts too long or doesn't go any place or whatever, you know, the organization doesn't matter. You know, just the sound part of it, okay, it's closer to the sound side than the organization side. Cage's big question that he asks himself his entire life is, if all the places in the middle of this spectrum are music, are the endpoints music? If you can imagine something that's just the sounds that are existing in the world, I think we'd think that was music. Can you imagine a system or a situation or a proposition where something can be all the way at the side of form, where there are no decisions at all about what those sounds are is that music too? And Cage would say yes. So Cage basically is saying our job as musicians is to build a box, to build a form, right? To build a box and to fill it with interesting stuff to listen to. Cage's um, contribution with four minutes and 33 seconds is at the farthest end of that spectrum, what if I just build a box? What if I just say, here's your opportunity to listen? And I don't know about you, but in my life, my life is really messy and is really hectic and is really loud. And it's full of all sorts of things batting against me all the time and things I didn't choose. 
the proposition that I might just sit and have permission to listen to something, that's a huge gift. And that's Cage's gift. Um, anyway, so I, again, that's sort of, it's not off the topic because that's the thinking which people got from Cage and which Saul LeWitt got from Cage. Um, this idea to say, if we are interested in figuring something out, our job as experimental artists and experimental thinkers is to push that idea as far as it can go. And our job and our duty is to keep pushing until we push as far as we can go. Um, so now, um, having blabbered a little, what I would like to do um, is I'd like to have us all perform a piece of music. So I'm going to need you all to stand. Okay. Um, so, okay. So we're going to perform a piece from uh, the the period of composers who were influenced by Saul Lewitt's emphasis <coughs> on conceptual art. You all have it. It's an incredibly important document. Okay. So this is a piece from the early '70s by a composer named Daniel Good, who's a New York composer an experimentalist who decided to start writing pieces that were more about actions than about um, where those actions would lead. So um, this is a piece called Stamping in the Dark. So I'm going to explain this piece, right? We're going to count together up to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We're going to do it slowly. Then we're going to go on where one would be, we're going to stop counting out loud, but we're going to count to ourselves. Where one would be, we're going to close our eyes so we can't see what anybody else is doing. And then to ourselves, we're going to count to ten. The next time you get to one, you're going to stamp on the ground where you think one is. And we're going to do this <coughs> ten times. So here's what you have to count. We're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We're going to count to 10. We're going to do it again. Right? We're going to, we're going to stamp each of us. We're going to stamp 10 times. Okay. Here we go. Let's do it. Okay. We're going to do it this speed. Try stamping really fast so, so you know. It's a, okay. Don't hurt yourself because you know, it's, a cement, it's a cement floor and, you know, um, you don't want to hurt yourself. Okay. Here we go. So let's count out that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Congratulations. Okay. You may be seated. <laughs> so what I love about that piece is um, 
It's very simple to describe what it is, and the result is very complex. So we had a really complicated, really intricate sonic experience, but we um, made it in a very simple way. What the composers were interested in at this period and the relationship to this work and to this world is that if the composer were in this audience, the composer would be hearing that piece performed that way for the very first time. Because every time you play this piece is different. So basically a situation is set up where the composer sets in motion something where the composer can stand back and be just as um, surprised and just as excited and just as um, literally in the dark as all the rest of us. So this is a tremendous and important um, stage in music from this period. And in order for me to tell you why it is, I have to tell you some things which are highly opinionated and which are probably offensive to huge numbers of people, so please do not quote me. Okay, um, but basically this work, this thinking, sentences on conceptual art as a reaction. Um, first of all, it's a, it's a great statement of a way to make something, but it's also a reaction against something. It's a reaction against the way the market worked. It's a, way, it's a reaction against um, abstract expressionism. It's a reaction against something. Music liked this idea from art, and we needed it because we had our own thing to react against. So this, what happened in music, the thumbnail controversial story about this is, we had to react against modernism in music. So after World War II, um, a bunch of really smart European composers, primarily European composers, came together, composers like um, Pierre Boulez, Carl Heinz Stockhausen, Luigi Nono, some you know, very heady people, started their own institutions following the works of none other than John Cage's teacher, Arnold Schoenberg. So, and Schoenberg had started um, uh, this idea which was very radical, which was that when music becomes really complicated and really dissonant, um, it's unfair to, um, to the, well, no, basically, um, what happens with Schoenberg is the idea that <coughs> dissonance, this discovery of dissonance is discovering things which are so beautiful, but on such a dissonant level that we don't have the tools from music history by using the sounds that we have learned from 19th century music to be able to work with them. So in order to work with these dissonances, we need a new system. And he invented a system called um, 12 tone music, composition with 12 tones. And this idea was supposed to be an aid. Bless you. We, we, the idea was this dissonant music had a value that it would not remind you of the music of the 19th century. It wouldn't remind you of music that had melodies and harmonies that made you think of everything in the past. It would allow you to do something that was completely new and completely fresh. And, and Schoenberg uh, essentially invented this 12-tone way of writing, this way of saying all 12 notes of the chromatic scale in an octave were equal. And he made up a system where you would say, I, I'm going to write this note, and I can't use that note again until I've used all the other notes of the scale. It was a way of making sure that these um, uh, sounds would not remind you of the music that we know from 19th century music. For him, it was sort of a bookkeeping device. You know, how do I use this system to keep me, to remind me of, um, of how to keep these notes spinning around in a way that avoided the harmony that we all knew? But what happened after the war was that these young composers, after World War II, decided that, that we had gotten into a war because of an excess of emotion. We had gotten into, into World War II because of an excess of um, people uh, being too uh, excitable, and we needed science 
to solve our problem, and they remembered this 12-tone system, and they turned this science into a kind of fetish. And so they decided, you know, very early on, and um, Pierre Boulez wrote all of these articles in the 50s that said, um, people who are not writing music with 12 tones are irrelevant and will be forgotten. And he also wrote that the point of this music was to make all other kinds of music so a lot of great music was written with this way of thinking, and you know these are really great composers and really important. So I'm not saying anything bad about them as composers, but their idea was they had found something that made all other music meaningless, and that's the lesson that they tried to give to the world. They tried to give this to their students. They tried to give this to their funders. They tried to give this to their institutions, to their universities. That this was the only valid way to make work. Um, the problem with this was that not everyone in the world wants to make music like this. And I will say this idea was very, very powerful. So the idea that someone found something that was so smart and so um, deep and so intellectually inspiring that only a few chosen people in the world were smart enough <coughs> and had good enough to understand it, this is a really persuasive idea, and many people were sold by it. So, um, and one of the, the well, an example of how powerful that idea was is that um, at the end of his life, Stravinsky was writing music like this. At various times in their life, Aaron Copland, you know, the composer of Appalachian Spring, was writing music like this because he had been told by young composers that if he didn't change his music, to be like this, he was irrelevant. Bella Bartok experimented with this. Dmitry Shostakovich experimented with this. You know, this is a powerful idea that these people found something that only if you were sophisticated enough, you could understand it. In America, we had a composer um, named Milton Babbitt who wrote a very famous article, which was titled, not his title, but it's the general idea of who cares if you listen. And the whole point of it was basically an apology saying, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but I'm part of this movement which has discovered something which is so beautiful, but so complicated that you'll never be able to understand it. <laughs> but I have to pursue this idea. I mean, there's something really beautiful about it. I love this article, actually, because there's something really kind of tragic about it. You know, my ears are so sophisticated that you can't possibly understand what I'm doing, right? So I'm a genius, right? You should let me know, right? I'm a genius, right? Um, so it's that last part which is the big problem because um, these people developed this idea and developed this worldview and very quickly there was a cult, literally a cult that would um, surround these people and, and this um, movement. And the cult was that the composer knows more than you. Well, you know, I have to say, I've spent my whole life, you know, in the nerdy world of composition. I probably do know more than you. Uh, but that's not a good thing. That's just like a fact of the fact that I've wasted so much time in my field, and you have. Um, but this was a cult of saying the point of, of what we know is to know more than you. The point of a piece of music is for me to give you something that proves to you how much more I know than you know. The point of your listening is to spend your whole life studying so that you might be able to, at some point in your life, appreciate just how much more I know than you know. This was the attitude of my teachers, and this was the attitude of the teachers of young composers like Steve Reich, Philip Glass, Lamont Young, Terry Riley. All of those people came up through the school system. They were all educated in conservatories. They all had this discipline. They all had these teachers, right? And these teachers were all giving them this same message because this was the um, universal American academic message. Um, what do you do if you don't believe? What do you do if that's not your idea? What do you do if you actually want to make music 
that connects to an audience. Um, the music world was completely taken over by this idea. And where those people could go, um, well, they had a couple places to go. So for Lamont Young, he went to um, music from other cultures. And Jerry Riley went to music from other cultures. And to some extent, um, Philip Glass and Steve Reich did as well. But in New York, where did he go? They went to visual arts. So because the visual arts world was going through this revolution called minimalism at that time, which was spearheaded um, by people like Solomon. So this idea of the sentences on conceptual art that you have here is a revolutionary document which had influence in the music world. And one document that you might want to check out, which um, if I had been a professional speaker, I would have put it out for you, um, is a document called um, Music as a Gradual Process by Steve Reich. And it is Steve Reich's attempt to um, write uh, a, a document which is like the paragraphs on conceptual art or the sentences on conceptual art of, um, of Solowit. So Steve Reich and Solowit were very good friends <coughs> and knew each other very well and their ideas um, influenced each other. But the thing which I think is so um, powerful for me is that again, just as, as these um, developments of Cage came out of the fact that he grew up in a world that shut him out and he had to find a place where he could belong. So Cage um, worked with dancers, Cage worked with artists because he wanted actually to go into the music world. He wanted to have a normal life as a normal musician and our world for its various reasons rejected him. These young composers in New York, Philip Glass and Steve Reich um, in particular, um, came through that same way. They, they, they came up through the music system and the music system said, you know, we're only interested in this kind of music and they had to find another environment. They came to this world and they came to this world of, um, of which was undergoing this great revolution of saying, you know, the idea is important and the idea leaves you someplace. I want to read you my favorite one here because I think it, it has the, um, the most meaning for a young composer going through this environment. Um, which is seven, which is number seven of the sentences, which is the artist's will is secondary to the process he initiates from idea to completion. His willfulness may only be ego. To young composers in, in the 60s in New York, um, it was seen that the job of a composer was to inflict your ego on the audience. That the point of hearing one of these pieces which is about the genius composer giving the genius ideas to the audience that can't understand them, that this was an act of ego. And if you read the writings of Terry Riley or, um, you know, he, he, um, and, and C. Reich, the point of doing these pieces was specifically to get rid of the composer ego, because this was to them the problem. Um, so the idea of making a process was that you could set something up, as in the Daniel Good, where we are all equal in the resolution of that process. And the ego, the idea that the composer knows more than you, becomes something which is irrelevant. Um, so very early on, I just want to talk about one piece of, um, of Steve Reich's, um, one of his purest works from this form, which does um, for him, the equivalent of the, um, of the Daniel Good is a piece called Pendulum Music. And this is a piece of music where um, a microphone is suspended over a speaker. And, um, and so, you know what happens when a microphone is in a speaker is that it feeds back. So that, you know, the, the speaker sends out its signal and the microphone picks it up and sends it back to the, to the speaker. So um, he set up a piece where there are four or more speakers that are, um, that are uh, suspended so that when they're um, hanging, they're going to be right over a speaker feeding back. He um, uh, would stand back from this and he would let the microphone swing over it and as it swings over the speaker, it makes the feedback noise and then it swings back and feeds back and stops feeding back, the piece is over when all the microphones are feeding back. 
So this piece was premiered um, at the Whitney Museum. Um, it was not premiered in Carnegie Hall. It was not premiered at Juilliard. It was not premiered where musicians go. It was premiered where people were interested in ideas and where people um, were open to the idea that music might actually be redefined. And that idea, I'm sorry to say, wasn't in the music world, it was in the art world. Thank you.